guys, I'm Shijane and welcome to my glass studio. So a lot of people have been asking me for an origin story of like where my glass venture started six years ago, so I thought I'd share that with you today. So six years ago, I was working full time as a waitress and I hated it. <laughs> I had been working in hospitality for the last eight years and I needed to make a change. So I made the decision to um, very abruptly quit my job. I actually walked out so that I could then dedicate full time to looking for a creative job. This was quite a risky thing to do, but at the time I had like no commitments. I didn't own a car, I didn't have children, I rented a room and a flat, and I was pretty happy to live off beans for a little while. So I started going online and looking for creative jobs and found Diddly Squat. A few weeks went by and I was really close to printing out my CVs again and looking for a waitressing job until I found an ad on Gumtree. And it was super vague. I think the entire ad was like three sentences. It was like part-time creative person needed, temporary over the Christmas time, working as a jeweler. The ad didn't even say where it was, what company it was for, nothing. But most importantly, it said no experience needed. <laughs> so I applied and I got an email back saying, could you come in for an interview? And the interview was like 9 a.m. the next morning. So I responded and said, yeah, sure, great. Um, can you tell me where it is? <laughs> So they gave me the address and it happened to be for a glass blowing studio, which I was not expecting. So I woke up the next morning and my alarm didn't go off. So I had to like scramble to get ready and get on my bike and get down the road to get there in time. And it was one of those, like, I very easily could have just gone, oh no, I'm going to miss it. I'm not going to make it. But I went and I got there literally like within the second, quickly parked up my bike and went inside. And she sat me down and she said, can I have a look at your portfolio? To which I said like, oh no, like you, you didn't tell me you needed me to bring in a portfolio. So I had like nothing to show her. I didn't even have like any images on my phone or anything. It was like going catastrophically bad. But bless her, like she took the time to like ask me what my interests were and all that kind of thing. And she told me about the glass studio and what she needed this person, this role to do. And she gave me a tour and showed me around the glass workshop. And I was in love. And I asked her like a whole bunch of questions. And I think I ended up staying for like an hour and a half until she eventually kicked me out and said, right, I've got another interview. Um, I'll let you know tomorrow if you've got it or not. And I so desperately wanted this job. So I literally walked out the door, turned to where I packed my bike, which had been stolen. I'm not making this up. In the hour and a half that I had in this interview, somebody came along and took my bike. But I stood there with my phone and I basically like texted her. I emailed her just to say like, I, I desperately want this job. Please don't give this, give this to this other person. I want it. I think three hours went by. I had like walked all the way home and I got a bing on my phone and I read it and uh, I got the job. It was part-time, it was only three days a week and I started the next week. And thus began my journey into glass making. I started learning how to make basic beads on the torch and then assembling them to make little jewelry bits. I also had a bunch of photography experience there and I got to sit there three days a week and use all these different glass colors and make all these different beads. It was fantastic. I ended up being there just over three months. The Christmas period had finished and they could no longer keep me on anymore. And literally just at that time, my partner got offered a job in Scotland and I was really hesitant to leave. I thought maybe uh, more work in the glass studio would come up in the future. So I wanted to hang around for that. But my boss was very honest with me and she said that they had been financially unstable for years and that the likelihood of the glass studio shutting down was like very high and that they could barely afford to keep most of their employees on full time anyway. So basically, don't wait for them. So I moved to Scotland. So I moved to Aberdeen, the grey city. It's called that because everything's made out of granite. And there aren't any glass studios in Aberdeen. So I went back into waitressing. But this time I had a plan. So four days a week, I worked as a bartender. And the other days of the week, I slowly started building up like secondhand basic equipment in order to start making my own glass. And this took months because I made very little money and I had like no savings to speak of. So I bought like a secondhand torch. And then a little while later, I got an Oxycon, a refurbished one. And then next I got a really big box of like off cuts of glass. This is basically all the bits of glass that they can't really sell. Uh, so they just put it in a box and hope that somebody will buy it. And I did. Until eventually I had all the little bits I needed to get started. The problem was I was living in a fifth floor flat. So I set up all my equipment in the second bedroom. I had like a normal office desk and I opened up the big window for ventilation and I made little beads. I do not recommend this health and safety wise. I should not have done it, but this is how it started. During this time, my partner was working full time and covering most of the bills, etc. And it was during this time that I got pregnant. 
And during my first trimester, I could not stop being sick. I had terrible morning sickness, which lasted all day and night, every day and night. And I could no longer hold down my waitressing job. So I was then at home all the time, uh, making my little beads and being sick. And we both knew, of course, this wasn't a suitable setup. We couldn't keep doing this. Um, he had settled into his job a little while now, so uh, we decided to look for another house, which would have some sort of garden with maybe like a shed or a garage, something like that, which I could work in safely. And eventually we found a little cottage in a little fishing village just outside of Aberdeen, which came with a little seaside shack, <laughs> which was honestly about the size of a large broom cupboard. But this little shack for me is perfect. It like just fits a little workbench in there. It's outside. So I had everything set up and I continued practicing my glasswork. But very quickly, I started to run out of funds. So I needed to get another part-time job. I was now coming into the second trimester of pregnancy. The sickness was starting to come down quite a lot. So I could actually hold down a job again. Being pregnant, I didn't want to be on my feet a lot or something high paced. I wanted something where I could be more sat down and something a bit more calm. And I actually ended up getting a part-time job in an art gallery. And this would be the very first place I would try to sell my work. So I made a bunch of uh, beaded bracelets and I took them in and she put them on the uh, gallery floor for me. And nothing sold. But even though I wasn't selling anything, I learned so much from this lady from working in her art gallery with her. She taught me all about the commission rates, how much you would have to charge for your work and your labour to make something worth your while, and kind of giving advice on how to tailor your work in order to have something sell. Eventually I did sell one bracelet, and I still didn't make any money on it because I didn't price it correctly, which I think she knew. But she wanted me to learn the hard lesson like every other artist needs to. And I quickly learned that actually selling through galleries is not what suits me personally as an artist. The commission rate was just far too high, typically between 45 and 60%. And typically people who are walking through galleries are more interested in buying a painting or a sculpture, not really jewellery. So it was at this point that I decided to try Etsy. So I took all the stock that I'd made for the gallery and photographed it and put it onto a little Etsy shop. So I got a little light box and um, I had a really cheap secondhand DSLR camera and I did sell a couple of bits. And I took some lovely photos and learned a bit of editing as well. I highly recommend Lightroom Classic for this. I opened my little Etsy shop. There wasn't an awful lot of traffic because I didn't really bring any. I wasn't on social media at the time so it was just really organic foot traffic that was coming to my page. And I sold a couple of bits here and there. And that felt honestly incredible. Like some strangers online were looking at like the, Im the things I had made and the images I had taken and were buying them. I think I made like maybe eight sales in total. And that was like maybe once every couple of months, but people were still buying them. And it was during this time that my son was born. And about a week or so after he was born, I actually ended up hosting a workshop. And it was at this little independent kind of craft shop which did workshops in like the bottom floor. So I put all my little bits of equipment into the back of the car and drove over and hosted a workshop for I think three hours. And all 12 people showed up, it was fully booked, all the slots were taken. And the lady I was hosting it with, like she did all the pricing for me and figured out what would work, she was brilliant. And I think for that workshop I made something like £700, which to me was just a ridiculous amount of money. And this was really validating for me in this moment because like I had like learned a little bit of my craft and I had shared it with people and they loved it. It was a great response and it was really successful. I really wanted to come back and do this again with her like on the regular, but I think she wanted a diverse range of workshops throughout the year. So she kind of had one slot per artist, which made sense and was reasonable. So unfortunately I couldn't rely on that as like a regular income and my space was way too small to have something like that. Also, she had her business and her social media platforms, like she had a mature business, I had nothing at this point. It was this same year later on in Christmas when I actually did my first market stall. So I paid, I think it was like £60 to have a little four foot table stall. And for one day I sold all the beads and necklaces and earrings and stuff that I had made as like little Christmas gifts. And this was a market stall that was actually set up for small makers so people could actually afford it and be a part of it. A lot of other market stalls and stuff that I looked at unfortunately were like in the hundreds of pounds and it was like just something I wouldn't be able to afford to do. This was more of a small local kind of thing for local people to come in and do their little crafts and hobbies and opportunity to sell things. At this point I am still not on any social media of any kind. So this is now about the two year mark. Everything has been very slow and steady but learning little bits here and there and trying things out. So it's at this point my partner is actually headhunted and is offered a better paid job. 
And for context, um, his job originally was like 20K, this job was about 22K, so it wasn't a huge jump, but for us that was quite a significant thing. And of course with a young baby to consider, obviously we just felt like we had to jump for it. So I had to leave my little seaside shack. So we moved to a place called Glams in Dundee, and it is in the middle of nowhere. We found a tiny little cottage, which had zero insulation, it was freezing. Hence why we could actually afford it. But it had a little outbuilding in the back garden. And this thing had holes in the roof. There was no running water, no electricity, no plug sockets, nothing. I think it was used about 50 years ago to keep like cattle in it or something. But it was like five times the size of my seaside shack. So it was great. But because it didn't have electricity, I needed a big like real, uh, an extension power line to run out from the house to the outbuilding so that it could work. And then of course the huge event happened that affected everybody, lockdown, COVID happened. My partner at the time was considered a key worker, so he actually kept going to work and was doing between 10 to 12 hour shifts. So for the most part, I was on my own with brand new baby and no one else to help. I was exhausted and basically all the torch work kind of got dropped for quite a while. The core focus for me at that time was keeping myself sane and rested as well as my baby. And of course during this time, like loads of other people, I was super lonely. I pretty much only saw my baby and my partner for literally months. And my partner would come in like at 11, maybe even sometimes like 12 o'clock at night. I'd wake up in the morning and he was already gone to work. My glass stuff just kind of sits in the outhouse for a while untouched. So time went by and the lockdown rules started to lift. You could go out for a walk like for an hour each day. So now the idea that I could get my baby and myself in the buggy and go to the shop and get some milk was like exhilarating. <laughs> and even some of the other little businesses around were starting to open again. And there was a little art gallery in the village. And of course, I just recently worked at an art gallery, so I was like, oh great, I'll, I'll take in a portfolio and maybe they might take some of my work. And I checked out their website and they said that they took on like local artists and, you know, promoted local makers, which was awesome because I literally live like five minutes up the road. So I kind of like got my drive back. I started going into the workshop and making little bits here and there and like I'd, so I could take some samples in for them. So I was super excited. I took my portfolio and I took my bits with me and I went down with the buggy and I went and I introduced myself. And I think at first they thought I was a customer. So they were like really chatting, really happy to see me and stuff. And then I mentioned that like I was a local maker and I brought in some stuff for them to check out and see if they liked it. And I was basically shooed out really quickly. I think I, I wasn't local to the area, I'd just moved there. So they didn't know me and therefore I wasn't a local. So they weren't really interested in taking me on. And you know, I was just picking up the ropes again and I was getting my confidence and my drive back and you know, this felt quite demoralizing and it left me feeling really quite deflated to be honest. So I put all my stuff back in the bottom of the buggy and um, I went to the corner shop to go get milk and stuff and then head home. And I was obviously very upset. <laughs> like I'm wearing one of these face masks and only one person can go in at a time, but I'm like, I'm streaming, I'm like crying at this point. And the chappy behind the counter who owns this little shop, he's having a little bit of chat with everybody. You know, he knows the situation. Everybody needs a little bit of company as well as picking up their bits. I get the feeling it might have been everybody's therapist, you know, around that time as well. <laughs> and he obviously spots immediately that there's something like quite wrong. And he asked me, you know, what's up? What's wrong? Are you okay? And I had zero reservations. I just opened up to him completely and I told him the, the interaction I had just had. And in that moment, he turned around to me and said, oh, well, I've got this shop window. Do you want to sell some stuff in my shop here? And I'm like, yes, please, that would be nice. <laughs> like, bless him, I was just such a wreck. <laughs> And he says, you know, like, have you got any of those bits still with you? Can I see them? So I take them out the bottom of the buggy and I show them to him. And he's like, oh, these are beautiful. These are brilliant. Yeah, I'd love to showcase these. Do you mind? Like, we'll put them in the window. Anything you sell as well. Like, I won't take any, any cut or anything like that. Just what you make. I'll, I'll just give you a text and you can come pick it up. And so that's what he did. I just gave him the pieces that I had with me. I just handed them straight over. And lo and behold, people were buying them. They were coming in to get their milk and eggs and stuff. And he would also say like, oh yeah, this girl up the road is making these and uh, people were buying them. And so when I sold something, I would get a little text on my, on my phone. And then he would say like, oh, can you bring sound some other stuff? The blue's popular or somebody's requested red. And then I go into my workshop and I make a little pair of earrings and whatnot and take them down to the shop. And I was not selling a lot. It was literally like one or two items every couple of weeks. And I think honestly that saved me the fact that i had like a little bit of purpose i had something that i needed to do and keep up with and it kept me going like i'm i'm just honestly so grateful to the people who like just 
gave me the little chances when they really didn't have to. And it's these people who gave me these key moments in my life, in my journey that like made me who I am today and I will always be so unbelievably grateful to them. So my drive and fulfillment was coming back slowly, but I was still incredibly lonely. And it was at this point that I downloaded TikTok and people were on this app recording what they were doing day to day in their lives. So after a long day and baby's finally sleeping and I'm absolutely exhausted, I would go on to TikTok and just watch these little videos. Like every day I would get these little updates of what people were up to and what they were doing and it was just great. And it really did give me this connection like to the world and to other people around me that I wasn't like directly involved with, but they were there. And reminded me that like, even though no one could see me, like I was still here too. And so I started making videos. And in the very beginning, I wasn't even filming glass stuff. It was just little silly bits around the house. I'd maybe get like a couple of hundred views or something like that, but people were then commenting and I was messaging them back. And I got this real sense of like actual community, which I so desperately needed. So we're there for a total of six months at this point and my partner comes home one day and says, um, right, the company that I work for is actually moving to a different city. So in order to keep the job that he's got, we will have to move again. And there's like no choice in the matter. Like if, if we don't move, he loses the job. Um, also, we're living super remotely. I've been so isolated for so long. I am actually tearing my eyes out to like move to a little town or something which has a lot more people. <laughs> and so we moved to North Berwick. So we moved into a pokey little flat by the seaside. And uh, North Berwick was quite an affluent area. And there was only one place we could afford and uh, it was because it had like a leaky roof. And of course the flat was just a flat. There was no shed or garage or anything to work in. And there was no way I was working out of a bedroom again, especially not with a baby around. So all of my glass stuff got put into boxes and like shoved in a cupboard for a while. And I didn't really know what to do at this point. So I looked into like commercial lets and they were all way too expensive. So that was no good. So then I had the idea of putting out a little post on the local Facebook page. Explaining that I was just looking for like a little art space and this is what I did and if anybody had like a spare shed or garage going that wasn't in use. And I got one reply and it was not remotely what I was expecting. So about a 20 minute drive away from the flat there was this uh, site with like 12 container units and they all had like little independence in them. So one was a guitar maker, another one was a coffee shop, another was a yoga instructor and it was just like this little community. So the response I had on Facebook was this lady who ran the place and had a spare container unit going. And she invited me to come take a look at it. And it was perfect. It was about 300 square foot and it had its own door with a lock on it and windows with little shutters that you could open for ventilation. And it had its own electricity with sockets and its own little meter so you could see how much electricity you were using. It had no running water, but there was like an on-site toilet that kind of like everybody used. Like this little container unit was perfect. Until she told me the price. <laughs> so they wanted three fifty a month for it. And I, I did, no, immediately I was just like, I'm so sorry for wasting your time. Just, I cannot afford that. And I thought that was going to be the end of it. Until she said, okay, well, what could you afford? And I was completely honest and I explained my situation. So I said like, you know, maybe 50, 100 pounds, maybe a month maximum. And she went, okay, come with me. So she took me around the front of the site and there was a container unit there, which looked like was having some sort of like porch thing built onto it. And it had like a big window in the front. And she said, what about that? I kind of struggled to realize what I was actually looking at. <laughs> so they were basically building this like little cabin kind of extension from this other unit. And it was about half the size of the one we had just looked at. She said, you know, it's obviously not finished yet, but in a month or two, the flooring will be put in and it'll have its own door and it'll be finished. To which I was like, uh-huh. <laughs> she said, there is a slight con. <laughs> which was like, okay, what is it? So the container unit that it was uh, attached onto was actually a theatre company and they were quite loud <laughs> and they had rehearsals all the time. So they had groups of people coming in wearing all these props and stuff and rehearsing lines. And the theatre company wanted to take half of the cabin that was being built as like extra storage is like basically just a large cupboard. And then the rest was going to be open for something else they didn't know what yet. So as long as I was comfortable with sharing, would that be okay and do I want to take it? So I did. So while they were still putting the floor in and stuff and building it up, I was like painting the outside. I got to put my own identity onto it. I put like signage up. And I remember like painting, roller painting the ceiling and like, cause we had a communal entrance, there was this like guy dressed up in a gorilla suit, just walking through and like casually waving hi. This, this was just normal for a while. 
and it was during this time that I started making TikTok videos about my glass and posting them publicly. And now that I had a proper little workshop with its own little identity and I had like an address. So this is when I made my website. So now I've got my little website where I'm selling things directly. I'm making TikToks and advertising my work and what I do, but I'm still only part-time. My partner's still the breadwinner at this point and I'm doing this basically just at the weekends. And I'm literally selling just enough to like cover the 100 pounds rent and the little bit of materials and stuff that I'm buying in. And all of a sudden I've got this wonderful community around me of artists. I went from being so lonely and isolated to now having people around me who I could have my lunch breaks with. And this is when I was making my pick of friendship content. So I was trying to make pals because I didn't know anybody there. I'd obviously just moved. So um, I made this little pig card. But I was really getting along with somebody and I kind of like wanted to hang out with them, but I didn't really know how to do that. So I would give them a little card with like my number and my name on it. And if they wanted to hang out, then they could let me know. And I was also making videos about this. And those videos blew up. I think everybody was experiencing loneliness at the time. So the pig of friendship as a symbol and as a concept really like struck a lot of people. And I still put these out today. This is the new version. And every single order that I sell goes out with a pig of friendship. So anyway, I'm making my designs and they're not really selling very well. And one day I got a comment saying, oh, could you make Howl's necklace from Howl's Moving Castle? I absolutely adore that movie. I grew up with it. So I make Howl's necklace out of glass. And I record the process and I put it up on TikTok. And I even made that design available on my website and I photographed it and stuff. And this was the moment that changed everything. That video went semi-viral. And I had about 200 orders, I think within three days. And straight off the back of that, somebody asked me to make his earrings. So I did, I know, put them up on the website again. And that one also went crazy. That month I made 7K. I had never seen this amount of money before in my life. And it was from here that I started my focus on making uh, pop culture jewelry. And I kept going with the Studio Ghibli theme for a while. I made soot sprites. I made Sheeta's necklace that glowed. I made Nausicaa's earrings from Nausicaa Valley of the Wind. And for a while there, it was crazy. Of course, with every high, it comes back down to a low and it balanced out again, which was honestly a bit of a relief because I was like working so hard at the weekends and I was going to the post office with just like mounds of packages. I was doing this all by myself. It was pretty exhausting. <laughs> So this huge spike happened, it came back down, and then I was back to maybe making like 300, maybe 500 pounds a month. And that money didn't stick around for very long. It accumulated a bunch of debt that needed to be paid off. We desperately needed a new car because the back windows were literally being held up with like black tape. But I had had a huge breakthrough. Like my art was selling. And I thought, great, over the next like year or so, I'll gradually work up and I'll be able to do this full time eventually. But right at that moment, my partner is made redundant. So of course, we were in a panic. Jobs were scarce, loads of people were looking for jobs and couldn't find any. And I was not making nearly enough to be able to cover things. So we agreed for a short while to swap roles. He was going to stay home and look after the baby whilst looking for jobs online. And I would go into the studio full time and make as many glass jewelry bits as I could and try to make enough money. But just like that, I became full time Monday to Friday. Because I had more time, I was making more items and I was making more videos. And that very first month, I made enough to cover all our bills. And this was like pure luck. Like there was no way this was gonna happen a second month in a row. So we were still desperately trying to get him back into work. But the second month came by, he hadn't found a job and I had made enough to cover our bills again. And it just kept growing. And before I knew it, I had just become the breadwinner. And we were saying a steady income. At this point, I became really interested in trying to recycle household glass. I was trying to turn this little blue bottle into like Sans Crystal Dagger, the one from Princess Mononoke. And I made a little successful prototype. What happened next completely changed everything and it was so unexpected. So I'm on my lunch break in my little container unit and I'm on my phone just having a bit of a scroll and there's this uh, notification from Crowdfunder. And it says something like crowd matching available for small creatives in Scotland. Applications take only seven minutes. And I could have just scrolled on by. But I was like, oh, okay, yeah, seven minutes. Just answer 10 questions. Why not? And I was really obsessed with this recycling glass thing. I didn't really have the equipment in order to pursue it properly. But if I had the funds, I'd be able to do it. So I told them all about my little business. And I took some quick shots of my phone of my little container and of the little recycled glass dagger that I made. And yeah, it took seven minutes. I uploaded it and I didn't think anything of it and I went back to work. 
I think it was two weeks later, and I got an email from Crowdfunder saying that I'd been chosen as one of 20 for the crowd matching campaign. Which honestly, I didn't think this was real. <laughs> like I honestly thought, oh, this is just some sort of a scam or something that I've fallen for here. But they had booked me in for a Zoom call with the representative for Scotland for crowdfunding, like for Creative Scotland. And I spoke with them directly. And they asked me more questions about myself and what I've been up to and how I got here so far. And that was it, they accepted me as part of this campaign. So I made my little crowdfunding page and I put up my rewards, which was like all of the nerdy jewelry that I'd made so far at like a discounted price. And it went live and I went onto my TikTok and I just explained that I was uh, trying to raise funds for new equipment. If anybody wanted something that I made, they could get it for cheaper and what they spent would be doubled by Creative Scotland. So it kind of worked out for everybody. And out of the 20, I was first to reach the max funding. So they gave me full funding. I had somehow managed to sell 10k's worth of rewards. So they gave me 10k on top. So I still had to fulfill all the orders and post them and package them and all that. But the money that was left over, I was then able to buy secondhand equipment. Most of which I found on eBay. I got a much larger kiln. I got a fabricator to make me a glass crusher. I got a grinding machine, which was from an old lab. Like my life was changing so rapidly right in front of me. And there was this feeling of like, I really felt like I didn't deserve it. I was definitely kind of feeling the imposter syndrome and my identity was changing so rapidly that my brain couldn't really catch up. I was now living as a full-time artist and supporting my family. I was living as a glass maker and I had grown this random community of wonderful people from the internet who were supporting me, who had never met me but were helping me and they wanted me to succeed. So now I had all this equipment and nowhere to put it. So remember that container unit she originally showed me that I couldn't afford and was too big? I moved into it. No one else had moved in in that time, so I took it. And they had to like remove one end of the container unit and fit double doors on it so that we could actually put the kiln in. That it got online on eBay for dirt cheap. And I was starting to notice that I was getting all this glass equipment for very little. And it was because more and more glass companies were shutting down. And there were these huge bits of equipment which were extremely niche and no one wanted to buy. A lot of people didn't even have room for them. So I was putting in offers which I thought honestly were going to be way too low. But they had literally nobody else interested in buying them. My big blue kiln for example needed to be lifted on a forklift to even get it into a van because of its weight. So I'm in my new unit, I've got all my new equipment. And then we get more bad news! So the site that I'm currently working on doesn't have enough electricity to run my new equipment. The grid is already maxed out with the amount of people currently using it. So that was a bit of a conundrum. But I thought that was okay, I can still be the breadwinner, I can make my beats, I can make my jewellery, I can use the equipment I was already using before and we'll eventually find somewhere else to set up and maybe move studios at some point in the future. But the universe had other plans. Our landlord that we were renting the flat from that we were living in decided she wanted to sell and that we would have to move out. Now our contract gave us six months until we had to move out and within that time we found nothing in our price range in the area. Like we shouldn't have really been able to afford there in the first place. And this was also right off the back of COVID. Um, two bed places were like really sought after. People were desperate for housing. And people were even getting into bidding wars over rental properties, which we could not afford to keep up with. And ultimately the studio where we're at and the new equipment, it wasn't actually any good. We needed more electricity, we needed more power. But now that we weren't tied to a job, we could work anywhere. We just had to find a suitable studio spot. So we needed to find a studio spot first, we needed to find somewhere that was suitable and then we could find a house nearby. And once again, I put a post out on Facebook, but this time to lots of local pages. And again, one person came back and it was for an old community hall that wasn't in use. It was 1,300 square foot, which was huge, but there was problems with the heating system and things like that. There were a couple of things wrong with the building, but it in the past had been used for a woodwork shop and they invited us to come and have a look at it. It was being looked after by a community trust, which was a small collective of local people who basically wanted to rent it out to somebody so that they could then put the money from the rent into looking after the building. And they really wanted to bring in young families with like a little business, so it seemed perfect. And we moved in and this is where we are today. So that's the whole story so far. I only really started filming my journey like halfway through it, so I hope this fills in a lot of the blanks. 
And I really wanted to emphasize that this did not happen overnight. <laughs> I get a lot of people asking like, how do I afford to do all this? And the truth is, is that it's been a very, very slow, gradual process. And my plan now is to start making videos so I can hopefully help people get into this the same way I have. The glass blowing industry is very difficult to get into. So I want to do my bit and I want to create videos and share the experience that I've accumulated so far for anybody who's interested in getting into this. So if that would be of interest to you, give me a follow. Thanks for being part of my journey and I'll see you again soon.